In the continuum, water starts in the soil, enters plants through their roots, through the stem, and then up through the leaves. We've already talked about water movement through roots and stems, and here we'll cover water movement through leaves. Water loss from leaves is controlled by the evaporative potential of the air, the water supply from the soil, and the stomatal conductance of leaves. Now we've already talked a little bit about the evaporative potential of air and the water supply from soil, essentially how much water the soil can hold and how tightly it holds onto it. The last factor to think about is stomatal conductance of leaves. Still in our basic formula, we need to think about driving forces and resistances when we think about the movement of water through plants. The driving forces are still the same, regardless of whether we're talking about roots, stems, or leaves, but the resistances can differ. And for leaves, there's one other factor that determines the resistance. In leaves, resistance is variable, unlike in roots or in stems. Stems, the size of your xylem does not change much over time, but leaves can have variable resistance on very, time, very fine time scales. And that's because of stomata. If you take a look at the surface of a leaf, individual cells can either be cuticular or be stomata. And these stomata can be open or closed and open to different degrees. And these are just all small tiny points of potential water loss through plants. In some cases they're closed and in, then the resistance is very high for water to move out through a leaf because it can't move through an open hole and then it actually has to diffuse through the surface of, of some of the other cells. And so when we think about leaves and we think about resistances, this is really the main point in a plant where plants can control water loss. Keep those stomata closed, not a lot of water loss is going to happen. Keep them open, a lot of water loss can happen. Now, diurnal and climatic differences in air temperature and humidity determine the driving force of transpiration. That part is clear. The hotter it is outside and the drier the air, the greater the driving force because the lower the water potential of the atmosphere. If it's cool and wet, that driving force is a lot less than if it's hot or dry. And these can change on diurnal time scales and over geographic scales too. Air temperature and humidity are climatic factors that really determine these drive, the driving force for transpiration. As far as plants are concerned, stomatal conductance is the major control that plants exert over water loss from a leaf. So the air might be dry, it might be wet outside of it. There's not much a plant can do about that, but it can do a lot about how many stomata it has and how open they are at any one point in time. Now having covered leaves, we're going to just talk about a synthesis for evapotranspiration and think about some of the state factors that influence evapotranspiration from ecosystems. Here again is a general diagram for state factors. We'll look at it just, we haven't looked at this for a while, so we're going to look at it closely one more time. Topography, climate, parent material, biota, time, and then human activities is the sixth state factor. And all of these state factors influence evapotranspiration out of an ecosystem. So if we ask for a given ecosystem, is it going to transpire or evapotranspire a lot of water or a little, we have to think about the topography, the climate, is it a hot and dry climate, a cool and wet climate, what soils are there, what the potential biota is there, because we know plants differ in their ability to transpire water, and then also the human activities and successional stage. In addition, microenvironment, disturbance regime, resources, and functional types are the interactive controls on the ecosystem processes that we care about. And in this ca case, we really want to think about evapotranspiration. Now, if we start to think about this, essentially we want to know if you have a particular climate, how much of an impact is that going to have on something like evapotranspiration. Well, in some cases, climates can 
have factors that increase evapotranspiration, and in some cases, they can have negative impact. If the climate's hot and dry, that might increase ET in some cases, but you also need to have a lot of precipitation to have water that can then be transpired. Other factors too include something like the biota. So this is a different state factor, and you can have biota, for example, with really deep roots, and that might be another case where you have greater ET because you have a bigger bucket. But there's other cases too where you have plants that just don't have a lot of ability to transpire water, and that would be a negative effect. The synthesis that the authors provide for evapotranspiration, these are the major factors that govern how much evapotranspiration comes from a plant canopy and the variation that occurs in space and time. Now to look at this again, it helps to work backwards through a diagram like this. Eventually we're going to understand biota, time, parent material, and climate and their impacts on evapotranspiration. But the first thing to think about are the direct controls on evapotranspiration. So in this case, aerodynamic conductance is really important for evapotranspiration. Having a rough canopy with a lot of turbulence serves as a positive factor that increases ET. The more stomatal conductance you have, the more open your stomates are, the more ET you're going to have. And the more water you have available to plants, the more ET you're going to have. Lastly, a high vapor pressure de deficit, high net radiation, lots of sunlight, that's also going to serve to increase ET. So ecosystems that have that are rough have a lot of stomates that are wide open with a lot of water available, and there's a lot of sunlight with high vapor pressure deficit, we're all going to have high ET. Now, this is a proximal control or proximate control. A distal control includes factors like surface roughness, which affect the conductance, the photosynthetic capacity of plants, and plants with high photosynthetic capacity have a high stomatal conductance. And then if you have soils that have a high water holding capacity for a given amount of precipitation, for example, that ends up being a larger bucket of water available for plants to transpire. And lastly, water availability is determined by precipitation in part. So the more precipitation you have, the more of it water you have available. So we can ask the question, what is it about an ecosystem that generates high ET? Sure, it directly or proximally, there's aerodynamic conductance to think about, stomatal conductance, water availability, and net radiation. But those are determined by how rough the canopy is, how much photosynthetic capacity you have in an individual leaf, how much leaf area you've produced, the characteristics of the soil, such as the water holding capacity, and how much precipitation you have. Now we can even go more distal and think about the interactive controls. And when we think about these factors, such as surface roughness and water holding capacity, the interactive controls really are the plant functional types or the plant species that you have there and the soil resources that are available. The more nitrogen available you have in soil, if it's a limiting factor, the greater the photosynthetic capacity of the vegetation, which is then gonna feed forward to higher evapotranspiration. And once we understand these proximal controls into the interactive controls, we can think about the biota, time, parent material, and climate. So a place that typically has a hot, dry climate is going to have a high net radiation, but also you need to have a lot of precipitation in order to, in the end, have a high evapotranspiration. Having parent material that generates soils that have a high water holding capacity are going to be necessary for high ET. Parent material that's really sandy, for example, might not hold that much water, and you're going to have a lot less evapotranspiration in the end. These diagrams we'll use a few more times, but it's something that we can use to start to think about and categorize the different ecosystems as far as evapotranspiration and understanding the proximal and ultimately distal control of evapotranspiration.